Hi guys, it is a somewhat a foggy, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in the waning days of 2019 here uh, where I am in the heart of Texas outside of Austin, but I'm not sure where we're going today. We're going to some undisclosed location somewhere, I believe, in the United States where I have the great pleasure of bringing on, oh yes, my name is Sam Mitchell and this is Collapse Chronicles and for this week's edition of Collapse Chronicles I have the great pleasure and honor of bringing on board and I hope I say this right, <clears throat> Gilbert Mercier. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I did that right. Uh, Gilbert Mercier is a French journalist, photojournalist, and filmmaker who has been based in the U.S. since 1983. He is a co-founder and a co-editor-in-chief of the excellent website News Junkie Post and is the author of the Orwellian Empire. And I could go on with this, but I don't want to waste any, uh, any more of our limited time. So, Gilbert Mercier, come on and say hi to the folks and we're going to dive right into this rousing conversation. Thank you for having me, Sam. It's, it's really a pleasure and, uh, and hello to all the, the listeners of, uh, of, the, of the Collapse Chronicles. And uh, what, what I would like to say that, you know, in our, in our initial off-air conversation, uh, Sam, you asked me if I felt that we were uh, sort of preaching to the choir as far as what could be an imminent uh, collapse of human of humanity, uh, and uh, you know we are we are indeed in many ways, uh, uh, especially in the U.S., uh, where a, a large fraction of people are climate change deniers or even science deniers. After all, we have a vice president that is a creationist. Uh, and also a secretary of education that's a creationist. So that is not a, a very good sign. But elsewhere in the world, the good news is that people are becoming aware that we are heading for a catastrophic outcome. Uh, and I'll, I will say why. For example, in France, where I'm from, I'm actually French, as you mentioned, in a survey taken in, uh, in uh, early December, so a few days ago, 60%, that is 6-0, that's a lot, of the population fear a collapse of our civilization. And for them, the causes of this collapse would be global warming with 36%, ahead of overpopulation, which is 17%, and finally, social inequality with 14%. Uh, however, the 27% of all those people survey think that COP25, which is taking place right now in Spain, will not bring any real solution to deal with the climate uh, crisis. And they are absolutely right. The, uh, what's very interesting in, the, in, in this survey uh, uh, well, the people in the survey, uh, uh, the people quiz in the survey are very confused about what would be a world post-collapse, uh, and then are not the only one. And this is precisely the type of scenarios, and your show is helping a great deal for that in terms of the conversation. Uh, I've listened to a few uh, episodes of it the scenarios that should be run by scientists, engineers, thinkers like yourself and myself, and farmers. Uh, because one, let's, let's be real here, one cannot count on politicians or corporations or even current international instances such as the UN to do this work. What, what is extremely compelling in this French survey 
is that people intuitively link the three critical factors of the climate crisis. And this is very important. I want to stress that over and over again. It is, the, it is in fact impossible to address the climate emergency without dealing with other population and social inequality. You have those three factors here which are completely intertwined. In effect, capitalism addiction to economic growth and population growth is responsible for our dire collective predicament. And that's again something that I've said, you know, uh, that I've written about many times and addressed on, on air, but I think it's, it's something fairly, very simple that uh, uh, your audience and people in general should, should kind of try to wrap their mind on. You know, unfortunately, I would say that the, the topic of overpopulation, and I, I think that you, you, you want later on in a conversation to address a piece that I wrote on this, is still taboo even with so-called green politicians. I mean, when I mention overpopulation to people, they, they kind of, you know, they don't want to talk about it. But it must be addressed. Why? Because currently we have 7.7 billion of people worldwide. As an indication, 100 years ago, okay, it was 1.8 billion. Still as an indication, in 1800, it was one billion. And what is even more scary is the fact that the projected number by the UN for 2050 is close to 10 billion. Of course, this cannot be sustained. You know, this is just impossible. Uh, you know, to give your listener a very simple summary of this sort of crazy uh, climate crisis, crisis equation, what we have is this. We have more people, 7.7 .7 billion worldwide, I repeat, right now, equal more housing plus cars plus consumptions equal less trees and space for biodiversity. And, of course, in that survey, and, and it's not something that is a, a, a detail, the third major factor of the looming system in collapse is uh, social inequality. In fact, a current brand of capitalism has become worse than feudalism used to be uh, back in the, in the Middle Age. Uh, you know, as an example, worldwide today, there is 2,101 billionaires and they control uh, an amount of wealth superior than 50% of the poorest population uh, in the world. You know, this is, of course, a large part of the crisis. A large amount of this wealth is a derivative of oil and gas extraction. You know, uh, people need to know that, and it's, it's something that is... Uh, of course, they do not get any coverage in most news outlets, but there is in the world 20 companies, okay, responsible for one third of all carbon emissions. I repeat, 20 companies. The top five are Aramco, Chevron, Gazprom, Exxon, and British Petroleum. Aramco and Gaz Gazprom are state-owned, respectively by Saudi Arabia and Russia. And Aramco, one interesting detail, is about to go public through an IPO, you know, within a, a few weeks. And it has worldwide investors, of course, uh, the, the Wall Street folks, licking their lips over it. Not only that, but it is very likely that pension funds of various countries you know, which could be the U.S., Canada, even, even, even countries in Europe, could end up investing through Wall Street Channel, investing the, their money into Aramco stock. You know, so 
this is what we have here. We have the 20 mega polluters that show that, yes, capitalism forms fuel uh, and profit from the climate crisis. Okay? And yes, humanity might eventually become extinct before the end of this century, largely because of the greed of its 2,101, exactly, billionaire and their political surrogate. Because, of course, this is one of the, the key problems here. Democracy as we know it, and I've written about that in News Junkie Post, is dead. Uh, politicians are controlled by corporations. They do the bidding of corporations. So that's what we have. And on the other hand, the hope is that young people, uh, especially young people, are starting to understand. And that, again, is not, the articulation is not great. It's kind of intuitive that we need a global systemic change, not just uh, uh, some, some vague uh, uh, talk about, about the, the climate emergency, you know, some vague green talk. Uh, uh, they don't want to have their future stolen by the madness of, uh, of capitalism greed. It is as simple as that. You know, uh, you know before, before COP25, uh, which uh, started last Monday in Spain, the, the EU adopted a, um, a climate law, what they call a climate law. And, uh, you know, it's in another conversation you and I had, another part of the conversation, um, you know, you, you sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk about the, the so-called progressive and green aware that have kind of a limp appendage. Well, this is kind of in, in this context. Uh, uh, you know, that, that, that climate law is a bit like that. If voted and met into a binding agreement, the target for EU members to reach net zero carbon would be 2050. Uh, but further, the EU greenhouse gas emission would have to be reduced by 50% by, 50 by 2030. But again, this is sort of like, in a way, a lot of a lot of wishful thinking and a lot of talk uh, the, this european green new deal and of course that will remind you of the the green new deal of the so-called u.s progressive uh, mainly focus on transportation and of, of course this is not enough to only focus on transportation and the bad news However, is that scientist says that to all temperature rise to 1.5 Celsius, which is basically the goal of the, the Paris Agreement uh, above pre-industrial level, uh, greenhouse gas must be reduced not by 50 percent, but by 65 percent, 65 percent by 2030. You know, this is, of course, completely unlikely, considering that the three biggest polluters in the world, mainly China, the U.S., and India, are not really, well, one of them is not complying at all with the Paris Agreement. This is Trump that just got out. And the two other ones are not, are not really on board. And they are responsible of 80% of carbon emissions worldwide. 80%. So, uh, one cannot be optimistic. You know, I've been accused for more than 10 years, because I've been writing about that for more than 10 years, to be sort of a prophet of doom and gloom. But I'm not a prophet of doom and gloom at all. The reality is gloomy. You, you know, the reality, one cannot be optimistic no day. Uh, to be optimistic, you'd have to be a fool. You know, uh, making the climate crisis officially an emergency, yeah, it's a good start. But we are already several decades behind many tipping points. You know, once again, to truly respond to the climate and ecological crisis requires a drastic rethinking of the socioeconomical system. 
That is a capitalist construct that has for decades rewarded pollution, environmental destruction by extraction of resources, deforestation, and human exploitation. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. This current catastrophic past is still going full tip in, in countries such as the U.S. We mentioned Trump, and he, who is a climate change denier, and Brazil, you know. Uh, but again, um, uh, and Brazil with Bolsonaro. Unfortunately, the EU plan, even the EU plan, barely scratched the surface and functioned sort of like, if you wish, uh, a bit like a band-aid that one would put uh, on the t on the t Titanic, you know. Uh, the the neoliberal, the, the the limp appendage neoliberal quoting you, uh, such as Macron in France and Trudeau in Canada, uh, they claim to be progressive, but mainly, you know, they just talk the talk, you know. They don't they don't do anything. Um, the, the only way to slightly increase, in my opinion, odds of survival as a species is to dismantle a capitalism with its suicide pathological quest for permanent growth and its correlation of stimulating other population to sustain consumption. And then we're going back to this, this French survey and people cannot formulate those type of things like I do, but they still, they have this notion. And this is a reason of optimism for me, you know. Uh, but however, the type of action truly needed would not be popular at all, you know, and that they, they don't know. Uh, imagine for a moment, Sam, the price of gas in the U.S. rising to $8 a gallon, uh, which would put it on par, by the way, with ga gas prices in Europe. Do you think that would go well with, uh, you know, Texan or, or people in Oklahoma or, or elsewhere, as a matter of fact, driving a pickup truck? Not so. Imagine a world, a worldwide moratorium phasing out entirely combustion engine vehicles by 2030, which is what we need. We need people to buy elect electrical vehicle. We need, we need those vehicles to be subventioned. We need to tax the rich. We need to tax heavily the billionaire. To, to, uh, we need to do stuff that is not, you know, that is sort of like almost, I would say, uh, not going to happen. Very, very. <laughs> it, it's not going to happen, obviously. And then the worst one is this, and I said that for the end. Imagine a worldwide one-child-only law, like the one imposed by Mao Zedong in China in the 60s. But this is what, Sam, this is, as a matter of fact, what we need. And it's not, it's not going like that. You know, needless to say, most people would not embrace willingly this type of measures. And you understand that. And as a matter of fact, government still reward people for having more children through tax, tax break. What they should do, they should do the opposite. They should reward people for not having children, but they will not do it. Uh, uh, regardless, I think that to salvage what we can, some pills are going to be very, very hard to swallow uh, uh, for people, you know. Uh, but can we convince uh, them? Can we convince people? Uh, I know that bo both you and I, we are, we are older, older men. We are in our 60s. Uh, it's, it may, maybe it's easier, easier for us to understand that. But can we convince reasonably people? To, to, uh, to do this kind of sacrifice, you know. And also, you know, as far as the UN um, COP25 going on right now, uh, 
we cannot expect much action at all from it. You know, as my uh, uh, news junkie post partner, uh, who is a terrific writer, uh, that, and she's also a scientist, by the way, she's a top uh, biologist, Daddy Sherry uh, told me, uh, knowing that I was doing this interview with, with, with you, uh, and she, as a matter of fact, co-wrote, you know, with me uh, uh, an article about other population that, that we did uh, six or seven years ago, very controversial at the time. You know, she just, she told me, she said, oh, another climate conference full of you and other bad personnel taking airplanes from all over the world with their wives or mistresses. It's the UN way to blackmail the US, the EU, China, and India into giving it, giving it money to keep quiet. And it's absolutely true, you know. But you had still at the UN on Monday, Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed world leader by asking, do we really want to be remembered as the generation that buried its hand head in the sand? You know, uh, but this is exactly what world leaders, politicians of all stripe and corporation are doing, except I would say that they are burying their, their head, not necessarily in the sand, but perhaps in a, in a part of their own anatomy. You know, uh, uh, systemic changes are needed, and that's what they don't understand and don't want to understand and cannot understand, because those changes cannot be accept, expected from top down, from elite who want to maintain a business as usual statu quo, you know. Uh, and meanwhile, what we have, we have this, uh, you know, because after all, you know, I, you mentioned that I wrote the Orwellian Empire. After all, we are in a full-blown Orwellian construct, which is also Kafkaesque because it's absurd, in, in a tragic irony, which, which really represents our time perfectly well, NATO leaders were meeting in London. And... But for one minute, in effect, Sam, I want you and your listener to imagine what the $2.2 trillion a year currently invested in the industry of death, of the global uh, military industrial complex, could do. What that could do if it was invested in climate issues. No, wouldn't that be nice? You know, uh, it, it, it's just, and then you have the an, another kind of absurdity and coming of flat field uh, and, and one of those, you know, elitist and, and somebody that was in power and, and he's having an, epip, an, an epiphany, uh, you know, and of course it's likely to be just world, but... Uh, John Kerry has just launched, and you're going to laugh some if you're not aware of it, an international initiative to address the climate crisis. And you know what it's called? It's called World War Zero. For, of course, zero carbon emission. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and, and, you know, it refers to the fact that we must bring our carbon emission to zero by 2050 to restrict warming. Uh, but, and Kerry stated, honestly, this time, um, things are getting worse, uh, not better, which is true. But uh, what Mr. Kerry should have, should have said, having another epiphany, perhaps, he should have suggested that World War Zero should be financed by the 2.2 trillion of the global industrial military complex. That, that enormous amount of resources that that uh, uh, monstrosity swallow. Do you know, you probably don't, uh, and your listener might find that interesting, that the Pentagon, this lovely US institution, has actually a bigger carbon footprint than Denmark in Europe. 
The Pentagon has a bigger footprint than our entire country. No, that says a lot about what we are not doing. Now, since the, the, the 1990, you know, there were a paper published, a very interesting paper, uh, in the, um, you know, in, in the world, I believe it was the World Meteorological Organization that published that paper. And they, they concluded that 2018 set yet another record in greenhouse gas emissions. So we are not definitely not on the right track. As a matter of fact, it's getting worse. Since 1990, just to give your, your listener an idea here, the reference here in the paper, uh, there has been a 43, that's 43 percent increase in concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Of this, 80 percent is CO2, and the rest is methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, the climate crisis is in unraveling, as you know, Sam, and it's unraveling as we speak. And people are just watching and pretending that, oh, well, uh, you know, things will get better. But no, things are not getting better. Many people are already dying from it worldwide. Millions are already climate refugees, and there will be more. It's only the start. In a few years, Venice, Italy, will be submerged as well as Jakarta, Indonesia, a city of 10 million people. And of course, the rich people in, in, uh, in Indonesia, the government, they're saying that, no, that, that's that crazy. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they're saying that they want to move the entire city of Jakarta, 10 million people, to Borneo, an island that is still perfectly fine. And of course, it, it will never happen, uh, never, never happen in a million years. What they will do, they will let the poor people die in Jakarta, being submerged in water, and the rich people will move to Borneo. Okay? So, uh, the consequences of global, you know, urban sprawl due to overpopulation, and I'm back to that topic because, again, you have those three factors. Global warming of the climate crisis, global warming, you know, uh, you know, gas emission, uh, overpopulation, and social inequality. Those are the three legs that carry this monster that is the climate crisis. Uh, overpopulation, you know, uh, has, of course, created this urban sprawl, those like 10 million uh, 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 people living in Jakarta. And the, the extensive area of earth covered by asphalt and concrete, uh, it, it has created the, the fact that the, the earth doesn't absorb water anymore. So when you have flood, you know, the water cannot go anywhere. So, of course, people, people die and people will die more and more. And Something else that people should realize. Concrete, by building huge concrete wall to protect coastline, it's not going to contain the, the rising water. It will not. Maybe for a little bit of time, but then you'll have a, a big hurricane or a tornado or whatever, and it will go over it. Uh, you know, and we will have, you know, now, now the nightmare scenario, and it's already there. We will have a rapid succession of droughts, fires, and floods. Uh, and it's not even on the horizon, like in France again. France had a massive drought and, uh, and a lot of fire last summer. And uh, just recently, they had, they had flood in the southeast, which is a beautiful region uh, near Cannes. And uh, 13, 13 people died. I mean, it's not a lot of people. But there's going to be more and more of those events. Uh, it's not even on the horizon. It's here. You know, um, and it is, it is, of course, a complete vicious cycle, Sam. You know, um, because what you have, you have, okay, you have drought. Then you have fire. And then you have flood. 
and then you have soil erosion, okay? Uh, and, then, and then vast areas of land, especially coastal land, of course, or land near, near rivers, uh, will become unlivable, you know? And this could affect, you know, uh, the, I mean, the collapse chronicle are ongoing right now. That's what I, I want to stress to, to people listening to your show. It's not even, we're not even talking about, you know, 2030 or 2050. This is happening. It will only, it will only get worse unless we do something that is mostly brutally unacceptable for 99% of people. Uh, the, those type of situation will affect uh, between, be, before 2050, uh, there will, will likely be 600 million people worldwide that will be refugees, that will have to leave the coastal area. 2050, you can expect that Florida will be largely gone. Uh, and you can also expect that um, rich people in New York City, and that's, I say that with a kind of a grim on my face, but, you know, of course it's only audio, uh, rich people in New York City and, and um, let's say, the Hampton, uh, we are also likely to be submerged. Um, so we need we need some drastic changes before 2050. Not not you know we don't have time. You know, uh, life on Earth. If if we keep going the way we're going, and we are, life on Earth will become hell for human survivors. People will fight for basic needs, such as food, water, and shelters. There will be some kind of dis disintegration of basic social behavior rule. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen, perhaps you've seen a two, two a very interesting science, science fiction movie. I mean, I used to work in the film industry. One of them is called Man Max Road Warrior directed by Dr. Miller. He's actually a medical doctor. It's an Australian film. And it, it kind of depicts a, a post-apocalyptic scenario. And the other one is Waterworld. Well, you know, it could become like that. You know, this is not that far-fetched. And, um, you know, uh, you know it, I don't know, perhaps if humanity is to have... Um, uh, some kind of acceptable future, uh, we should probably look into ways uh, of living the way people were living in the past, uh, sort of like before the Industrial Revolution. You know, we, we perhaps we need to say, okay, um, we failed. The, the, this expansion... Uh, fail. You know, think about it this way. Um, perhaps the future, and I know it sounds like a paradox, but perhaps a future, uh, and I don't see how it's going to happen, but it could happen for like in, in a couple of hundred years, if, if some humans survive. Uh, perhaps a, a good future would be in our common past. Uh, such as, you know, small subs subsistence farming community, like the Amish. Yeah, like the Amish. Uh, the Amish style of living could be leading the way. Community that are self-sustained, where people grow their own food. Um, you know, uh, much smaller government or, or almost or, or just local government. Um, and there's people, there's a lot of people that believe in, in um, technological fixes to a, uh, you know, to a problem. And, you know, I, 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 think it's, I think it's really, a, you know, it's a pie in the sky because technology, and again, that's a paradox, technology was supposed to improve the life of man, but it hasn't. Technology... And the expansion and this kind of craziness of development has actually not improved uh, the nature of our life. You know, life, 
of generation way before yours, or ours, like 200 years ago, was probably at, at a better quality. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Why, for example, uh, you know, invest in, in technological fix to extract CO2 from the atmosphere while the massive reforestation is a natural answer? Why indeed? You know, and, and you know, thinking like somebody like Elon Musk, which is kind of a, you know, kind of a symptom of this capitalist disease, you know, the, the, the CEO of Tesla, uh, why thinking that the answer is to, to go in space, to go in like to Mars or to, to live on orbit uh, around the Earth, you know, why think that, you know, um, you know, let, let, let's put it this way, Sam. Uh, natural forces unleashed by the climate crisis uh, might cure human arrogance for good. And I think that's probably the best part of it. But the quality of humility, which humanity doesn't have, will be discovered by most of us too late. Uh, we are entering a, a very, very tricky and kind of deadly phase here of, of, of the human adventure, uh, and it could be uh, the last phase, you know. The clock is ticking, Sam, and uh, I, I don't think time is on our side at all. You know, it's not on our side. You know, and it's not, it's not like government uh, policy makers it's not that they didn't know. You know, for the past 50 years, since 1970, climate scientists have accurately forecast global warming patterns, and they've been right all along. Based on current projections, even if countries follow through on pledged climate policies, which they, they are not doing and they won't, the world is on track for about three degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial temperature by 2100. Some French scientists forecast a warming as high at seven degrees Celsius. So this is very, very hot. Uh, of course, all scientists predict this would be catastrophic. Uh, but we should prepare ourselves for this worst case scenario. Uh, and how could we possibly adapt to it? You know, one of the things that I mentioned, and it sort of, it appears to be a little bit loopy at first, but uh, I don't know if you heard, you know, anything like that, Sam, but I think I wrote about it before, that perhaps creating vast subterranean cities uh, type dwelling could be an option. Why not? Uh, it can be done, you know, uh, air temperature when you when you underneath is, is relatively stable, so it wouldn't go way up. Uh, the atmosphere would be all right. It can be done, you know, technically it can be done, considering that the technology was successful to dig this massive tunnel uh, under the channel between the UK and France. So uh, life could get some organized, you know. Uh, we could have greenhouses. We could have solar panels on top of those those massive underground city. I mean, perhaps it's just science fiction, but I think it's it's time to get people who, who can actually think of, of true alternative to say, you know, that's perhaps an option, you know, because what we have right now, we have, uh, and it's almost, you know, I'm not a religious person. And of course, you know, one of the problems is, besides being climate change deniers, some of Trump supporters, and, uh, and I live in, in an area of the country that I call, uh, not far from you, as a matter of fact, that I call Trumpistan or Trumpland. And in this part of the country where 95% voted for Trump, uh, it's, it's like the, the, the art core, born again, Bible belt. And people do believe that uh, uh, all of that doesn't matter, that God has a plan, 
and that if you uh, accept Jesus, uh, uh, you will be fine when Jesus come back for the rapture. And they believe that. They, are belie- they, they, they believe that. And so they're optimistic. However, uh, uh, Jesus is not going to come back uh, with a horse, with a trolley, uh, with a bus, with an airplane or a spaceship. He won't come back. Uh, you know, because in my opinion, of course, uh, it doesn't exist. So anyway, w- w- what I'm trying to say here is that the 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 was of, of forces we have created and we have created them, you know, by our activities. It's it's really upon us right now, and uh, and most including those climate deniers, but also including the people that are sort of on. Um, uh, mental autopilot, you know, uh, who, who does not belong to our choir, which is people that, as you said, you know, people that we already have convinced of the validity of our point, uh, they still believe that things are going to go like that, go on forever with their children, grandchildren, and so on. You know, uh, so this is what we did, you know, uh, instead of respecting our hosts, planet Earth, uh, for its countless abundance and generosity. We have trashed it after squeezing it like a lemon. That's pretty much what capitalism has done. What we have done, because we are all guilty as child, we are, you know, of course, some are a lot guiltier than others. You and I, you know, we have a share of guilt, but it's it's minute compared to decision makers uh, worldwide, you know. Uh, and as I was mentioning to you, a fair, you know, uh, Homo sapiens, 357 years ago, and then primitive civilization that follow, they were shipped on Blue Planet. And we should have keep doing it. We forgot that we were only guests. Uh, we behave like uh, we have this sense of ownership. And again, you know, I want to bring back an element of a conversation on air. Native population, indigenous population in the America and elsewhere, did not have the sense of ownership of land, the sense of, of uh, planet belonging to them, you know. Uh, I, I always laugh when those green politicians, uh, they used to say that a lot years ago, you know, they used to, to use the term, save the planet. The planet will be fine. The planet without, without us actually will be better. Other species will be better when we're gone, you know. Uh, let's put it that way. The, the, the homo economicus, the homo economicus is the economic man, the man of greed, of the post-industrial revolution, in his ignorance and arrogance, uh, thought he could exploit all resources and master natural forces. This is about to end in a form of collective suicide, uh, Sam. It's kind of a punishment, if you wish, for 150 years of ecocide. We are all, and especially people like Trump and Bolsonaro, and all those like uh, obscurantist neo-fascists, uh, responsible of ecocide, uh, which is the the genocide of our ecosystem. Uh, our current society. I, I just want to make a funny analogy, you know, and then we can we can go on to a, to a various question and. and and prolong the conversation. A current society, if you wish, is like a middle age of a white man, you know, with diabetes, uh, who already had a heart attack, but still smoke a pack a day, eat red meat, bacon and eggs for breakfast, do not exercise, but is still in denial of his imminent death. 
The problem, our problem, sir, everybody's problem, is that if Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens in Latin means wise man, if Homo sapiens were wise man by becoming Homo economicus, we have become Homo stupidus, we have become stupid and destructive. And this is the way I see sort of the state or state of affair, which is grim. Well, there you go. I, uh, I have to say, Jill Bell, you are the single easiest interview I have. You, you told me uh, that I didn't have to worry about prodding you and, and drawing you out. You have gone straight for 45 unbroken minutes on one of the most articulate, uh, spot-on analyses of, uh, of where we are, uh, how we got here, and I guess the only question now is where are where are we going? And it seems like you, you've pretty much kind of uh, kind of answered that. You have told us what needs to be done, and you have let That's us. That's right, Sam. And you've let us know that it ain't going to happen. What needs to be done isn't going to be done. So draw your own conclusion. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I am so happy you discovered me. And when I saw you reading my text with your lovely dog, I, I was at first a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, slightly pissed because you butchered my name. But besides that, I was very happy because I thought, ha ha. This is interesting. Some some sovereign man, not even a Yankee, some sovereign man <laughs> is 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 getting into getting into the real thing. So maybe maybe there's like a flickering light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe there's a flickering light after all. You know, uh, we need to. We all need Joker side, Sam. We need to put our thinking at together. Uh, we need to to address this. And John Kerry, I've liked some of the stuff he's done in the past, mainly when he tossed away his decoration after he fought in Vietnam. I like that part of Kerry. Uh, everybody, everybody has to be on board, but it has to be, it has to be again, it has to be systemic. There, there need to be major, major change, uh, you know, and hopefully people will start you know, our, our governments, and it's all of them, and I'm making no exception, China is not a communist country anymore. China is a capitalist country. You know, uh, we would kind of need, and I have to say that, you know, at my background, political background is sort of Marxist, you know, neo-Marxist, but not anymore. I mean, it's, it's gone anyway. China is not a, a Marxist country anymore. It's a capitalist country. It's a proto-capitalist country. We need, I, I truly think that a form of eco-socialism might be the answer to a problem, but the, the, the issue is the, the people in, in control, the, the corporation, the head of corporation, uh, and the political uh, 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 servants, because they are servants, Trump, Macron, Trudeau, Modi, all of them, Putin even, oh, nothing. They are just serving, Putin served the interest of Gazprom and so on. Uh, 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 this is what we have to stop. This is what we have to challenge. And unfortunately, you know, young people have been following with interest uh, Greta Sundberg, and I think it's remarkable uh, the, the stuff she's doing, but unfortunately... She doesn't kind of, well, she doesn't have the tool to articulate the, 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 the socioeconomical dimension of this. You know, that's the problem. She's only 16, and uh, she, she's, she understands a lot more at 16, but, but so far she's buying into the, uh, you know, to the Green New Deal gang. Uh, but we, we will see yeah, how she... It, yeah, because they, they're using her, uh, Sam. That's what they, they're doing. They're using her. 
Yeah, we, we, we've gotten into this debate before on, uh, and, and it's gotten me not, not, nothing but, but trouble. Uh, but I, I will have to say that, that this has truly been enjoyable and I have just uh, love it where I've just been able to sit back and, and relax. But here we are. Here we are at this point uh, in, in the interview where global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse in a few minutes. So I want you, if you've listened to my interviews, you're not going to be surprised at, at how I how I wrap them up before before we move into this I do just want to let people know that news junkie and I will put the link is where you can find it. if you like what you have heard and want to hear a lot more what this man has to say his excellent oh, website and I, I, yeah and I sorry to, to interrupt yeah. him, but also news junkie post and also my remarkable uh, colleague uh, a uh, co-editor in chief of uh, of the site, Dali Sherry, and also the author of um, um, of of a book about Haiti, uh, of, about you know a revolution that's uh, that's needed in, in Haiti, and uh, they should uh, they should uh, really check uh, check check our site, and uh, you know we have also a bunch of of the writer. Uh, uh, including Imtiaz Akhtar from uh, from India and a, a bunch of other people, but it's like you know, uh, uh, people come and go, and it's uh, uh, it's just the way it is on operation that are you know uh, pro bono, and uh, you know yeah. we do not pay, uh, you know we don't we we do not believe we actually try to respect uh, uh, sort of what we preach, which is a. Uh, Sort of anti-capitalist uh, uh, overall discourse, you know. Okay. Well, uh, I- I- anyway, I did. I just wanted to make sure people knew where oh, they could well, go. By the way, find... uh, I'm, I'm interrupting again. I had a lapse. The, the book of Daddy Sherry is called "We Are Dare to Be Free," and it's about uh, uh, we are dare to be free, and it's about the the Haitian Revolution and Haitian history, and it's a fabulous book. Uh, and uh, and anyway, so yeah, people should check out our site, you know. And uh, but most importantly, I think we need to keep the ball run rolling. We need to we need to keep talking about this. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, people should not waste their time about the 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 politic, uh, the spectacle of of politic being a Trump impeachment or whatever it is, because it doesn't matter. This is just distraction. What matters is what you talk about on your show. That's what matters. Okay, and so let's, as I wrap up every one of these, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell, uh, Collapse Chronicles, where you had a free reign for an hour, and you actually had the mainstream media sticking a microphone in your face, and you had 60 seconds to s- sum up the Gilbert Mercier message to planet Earth in the waning days of 2019. What would those 60 seconds sound like? Uh, we have to... Uh, uh, it, this is truly an emergency, and it's, it's an emergency if you have children, if you have grandchildren, it's an emergency for them. It's also an emergency for you because it's already unraveling. And, uh, uh, in a, you know, it will not be progressive. It will be, there will be a tipping point where things will become absolutely atrocious. Uh, a parenthesis this year, I started becoming very, very acutely aware and, and, and reporting this after Katrina in New Orleans, I used to have a house in New Orleans. People need to wake up. People need to wake up and consider what is important. Okay, and with that, we are going to have to uh, wake up to the fact that we're getting ready to be shut down here. And so, guys, if you did enjoy this this interview, I hope you take a few minutes to, uh, a few seconds to go over there and thumbs it up. Or if you did not enjoy it, 
thumbs thumbs it down and by all means if you want to hear more where this came from subscribe to Collapse Chronicles but right now as much as this pains me and and stick around uh, obviously after after I hang up here but we're going to have to wrap this up and say Gilbert Mercier we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your schedule to tell it like it is and more importantly we really appreciate your lifetime of hard work bringing this information out there and keep up the good fight thank you very much for having me son it was really my pleasure okay bye guys